As we continue to grow as a global society, developing new technology brings new chemicals along with it. These new chemicals can turn out to be toxic for living systems, causing damage before we even realize they exist. When we dig deeper into the soil, we are finding toxic pollutants from centuries of unregulated industrialization. In ecosystems, organisms will eventually evolve to break down pollutants as a way to survive, such as these termite ants that cultivate a fungi to degrade woody biomass. Because yeah, at one point, even trees and woody biomass used to litter the earth. But because the timescale of evolution and the timescale of technological advances vary so broadly, we cannot wait for evolution to provide us with solutions. Here is where human gumption and eons of evolution combine to create the world of remediation. Remediation comes from the root words which mean to heal back, and in this context is meant to heal a living system back to its original state. Conventional remediation practices often use chemical and physical methods to treat the polluted material, and although they can provide faster results, these methods tend to create secondary pollution, are more expensive, and prove ineffective for low concentrated but highly toxic chemicals. Enter bioremediation. This type uses biological organisms from the microbial, fungi, plant, and animal worlds. Organisms are constantly uptaking, converting, digesting, concentrating, and moving chemicals all around the ecosystem. Fungi and microbes usually release enzymes to break down pollutant chemicals, while plants and animals usually uptake the pollutants. But with all the different kinds of organisms and all the different kinds of pollutants out there, the question becomes, how do we know an organism to try? First, we identify an organism's relevant biological mechanisms, then experiment with the organism on the pollutant, and finally test to see if the organism successfully reduced the level of toxicity. There tends to be the same troublesome pollutants to deal with, so bioremediation is usually split into three categories. Soil and groundwater, air, and water. Land treatment for soil and groundwater happens in situ, meaning it happens right there, right where the polluted soil is located. Ex situ means it would be transported and treated outside of the polluted area. Soil holds everything together, accumulating a lot of pollutants and toxins from chemical spillages to industrial emissions. The most troublesome pollutants in the soil are heavy metals such as lead and cadmium, which cannot break down like the other organic-based pollutants. An effective bioremediation method for these soil and groundwater pollutants is through utilizing trees, specifically ones that are fast growing with longer roots such as poplars, willows, and black locusts. These trees can suck up as much as 30 gallons of groundwater per day and can store these heavy metals in their wooden structure. If there is a low enough concentration, they can even be used for building purposes, effectively removing heavy metals from the soil and storing them till later, reducing the need for hazardous waste disposal. Researchers are now exploring how to modify tree genes to help clean the air through their leaves, so at the same time as remediating the soil, they can remediate the air. Bioremediation of air generally involves passing polluted air over a medium containing microorganisms. The microorganisms degrade contaminants into products such as carbon dioxide, water, or salts, while using the energy and nutrients to grow and reproduce. Polluted air is a byproduct of industrial processes and contains ammonia, sulfur dioxide, and formaldehyde. It usually does not smell really pleasant either. Recently, scientists inoculated blue pea plants with bacteria that can remove formaldehyde. The experiment found that not only did it show successful removal of the air pollutant, the plants grew better with the added bacteria. Finding the right combination of plants and microbes is another bioremediation pathway, where the result can be cleaner air emitted into the environment. When it comes to water treatment, it can be hard to catch the pollutants when they are moving through the hydrological cycle. This is why a lot of bioremediation occurs on stormwater runoff, as it is often the beginning of pollutants entering our waterways. Biofilters for stormwater are starting to experiment utilizing the remediator species of fungi. Through inoculating a media such as hardwood chips, with a fungi like turkey tail, damaging pollutants such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, can be reduced. In addition, Stropheria fungi have been shown to eliminate E. coli and other harmful bacteria from pet wastes and our waterways. Biofiltration with fungi can easily be added to enhance pre-existing stormwater management practices, such as those in rainwater gardens, bioswales, and bioretention cells. In those designs, we can incorporate all the bioremediators together, the fungi, microbes, plants, and animals, in a super-remediative system. 
At this point in time, microbial bioremediation is being used in larger scale soil remediation, in industrial air pollutant applications with biofilters and biotrickling units, and in water treatment plants with bioreactors. Although often very effective in utilizing biology, these systems cost millions and aren't accessible for small scale community or homeowner applications. Accessibility, cost, and use on lower levels of contamination make grassroots bioremediation efforts a great option for community and individual level installation. More research and funding for testing needs to go into bioremediation so we can discover which organisms can help us to heal the earth back to its original state. <laughs>